Welcome, everyone, again. Um, thank you to Team Experimenter for bringing us together. Um, ECH, for short, is an open frame that is continually in transformation. A convening, as we have discussed, of minds, but also positions that we strongly believe have not only an inspirational function in the art worlds we are situated in, but a foundational methodology that is compelling to open up and examine together, addressing therein also this rather cacophonic era. At ECH, we think it is more productive to not only deliberate successes and ambitious feats in the curatorial realm, but also failures and inequalities, long-standing commitments by our participants for what they believe in and the power of the curatorial voice, and also of those chance operations and intuitions in our gut that make us do things every day. We think about curating in many different registers and hemispheres. We think about curating in museums, archives, education platforms, self-organized festivals, and publications. So this isn't necessarily, I was, I was sharing uh, with one of our participants that we don't have a thematic, but we have commitments and, and we um, have this forum really to, to think uh, very much about methodology. We have also, um, in throughout the years, uh, invited uh, the artist curator really as as a as an authoritative and very um, important part of uh, the South Asian um, curatorial uh, scene. Really, uh, we do not separate artist curators from the professional curators, um, and there are many reasons for that when one looks at uh, South Asian art history. Uh, we think about uh, the artist curator and arts organizers as provocators, as agents of dissensus in a consensus-driven art world, navigating the impossibilities of our current milieu in terms of socio-political and physical infrastructures. Um, so this year we have Anita Dubey um, and Shaina Anand, and we have also had um, several of the previous uh, curators of the Kochi Missouri Biennale, and, it's been um, a great joy to actually really uh, discuss uh, the, the curator's stance and uh, their experience the year after the, the Biennale. Uh, we've also uh, been working towards uh, harnessing the energies that are um, present in Asia and the Asia Pacific in relation to artistic and curatorial dialogue. Um, so this is really also a very conscious um, selection in terms of bringing uh, South Asian participants from um, Nepal, from Sri Lanka, from Pakistan, from India, from this time we have participants from, um, from who are located in Dubai, in Australia. The Asia Pacific, again, is another um, scheme of experiences and exchange, uh, long exchange, and uh, we feel very happy to have Tarun with us, following from Maud. Um, and uh, so in that sense, really thinking about critical regionalism uh, as can be practiced through associative histories, geographic affinities, practices of friendship across borders, and institution building that takes location as a grounding for imagining otherwise and away from imperial models in the staging of contemporary cultural environments and public education. I just wanted to mention, uh, for those of you who weren't with us uh, in the last edition, just a few quick notes from some of the um, kinds of subjects that came up uh, in the last edition of the Hub. Um, so it's a, it's a bit of a recapitulation. Um, we had Sabi Ahmad and Jibesh Bakshi. Um, both were participating uh, in, in curating the Shanghai Biennale, and they spoke about the very different methodologies of conversation and affective labor, creating pedagogic circulation within the Biennale format. Um, and it is, it, again, the, the hub also is in that sense a, a major uh, informal learning environment because one still realizes that after all this time, there isn't, curating doesn't have a standalone curriculum within Indian academia. So it isn't a course that 
can be really taught year long in that sense we're all kind of learning here together. Erin Gleason um, spoke uh, about experiential knowledge, oral memory, and the long aftermath of trauma as key to navigate lived history and collectively initiated arts platforms in Cambodia. This time we have Zoe um, joining us from Vietnam who has worked in Sharjah and many other um, conditions of uh, really convening not only exhibition making but also dialogical and educational processes. Adam Shimjik spoke about Documenta 14 in which we conversed together, really also what it meant as a communal endeavor to have a bi-located Documenta for the first time, really something that was a model of models um, and a, a time-centered mega exercise from which uh, you know, we are still uh, in a way recovering and uh, still finding the resonances of this exercise in many parts of the world, many of those agendas being implemented in major institutions. Um, architects and researchers Prasad Shetty and Rupali Gupte, who are also uh, collaborators of CAMP, Shaina Anand is here, we're talking about urban forms of life, the blurred and corroded edges of city spaces, porosity in housing and densifying urban mobility, the transactional capacities and affective substance of kinship and care that run in our metropolitan environments despite neoliberal pressures, running against the logic of cellularization of life. We also had Luli Eshragi, um, who spoke to us of a hybrid indigenous identity and a multiplicity of, uh, of languages, really using this polyphony of one's own identity and spirit um, as a way to think beyond the political correctness of what it means to bring together indigenous practices and indigenous sovereign worlds into uh, contemporary cultural spaces. And uh, Lily also talked about mourning and ceremonial practices um, as very important ways in which a uh, corporeal language develops um, around, a performative language develops uh, around bringing together these um, exercises in life making. Uh, we also had Bonaventure, so Beijing Nikung, um, who firmly spoke about de erasure moving against the amnesia of institutional memory and using sonority as a mechanism to remember histories as long suppressed returning echoes. I'm going to close this introduction um, now with a quote um, by the poet writer Ocean Wong, uh, which I've been returning to uh, over this year in um, different texts. He says, we often think of survival as something that, is, that merely happens to us, that we are lucky to have. But I think of uh, survival as a result of active self-knowledge, even more so a creative force. And so this survival as a mode, um, as, as this, a survival as a creative mode really uh, took me somehow. And I was thinking how we can really look at um, collective survival rather than the individual breathing life as a way to think about planetary struggles that we are currently within. Um, and how this dramaturgy of survival and chaotic kinship is also what is foundational to curatorial practice. Thank you and welcome. Uh, Naomi Beckwith, our first speaker, is Manilo's senior curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago and a former senior curator at Philadelphia's Institute of Contemporary Art and Studio Museum in Harlem. She has uh, curated numerous exhibitions and one of these that she will speak about today is the Freedom Principle, Experiments in Art and Music, 1965 to now. Naomi is also a brilliant writer and her, her work appears in uh, several publications and also news media. Uh, she is a multiple grantee and now trustee of the Andy Warhol Foundation of the Visual Arts and is, re is the recipient of the new Leadership Award at Art Table, where she is a trustee. 
We've been waiting uh, for more than two years to have her join yeah. us, so very, very pleased. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha, for that introduction. And um, today, in fact, is Thanksgiving in the United States. And so it's only apt that I start with some very special thank yous, first to Priyanka and Pratik. Um, as Natasha said, I was invited last year to participate, and I really, really wanted to. The timing didn't work out, but I'm so grateful to be here today. So grateful for the resources that it takes to bring me here to Calcutta. Um, but also to participate in what really is an incredibly important forum and dialogue in this place. And first of all, I congratulate you, Priyanka and Pratik, on the many successes and the 10th anniversary of Experimenta. I also want to thank, of course, the, the Experimenta team who helped bring me here, especially Shivani, who had to partake in a months-long sort of a soap opera uh, around my flight, my funding. Uh, and my visa, so thank you for coming along with me in the drama, and of course other members of the team like Didi and, and all the members of the American Council who not only gave me funding, but in support in sort of getting me to a place where I could find my way to Kolkata. It's a city that's held a lot of sway over my imagination for quite some time, so it's really interesting to put a reality to that imagination, and of course, as we all know, there's more explorations to come. I um, am here from Chicago. It was a very long flight, so I will have to ask your indulgence. I decided to write my notes down because I never knew where my mind would be. Um, there was coffee just delivered to me, but I'm going to abstain right now. So <laughs> to, keep it all, to keep it all together, it's written down. But as everyone has said, I'm very much looking forward to a conversation with you all. I really thrive on the opportunity to be here today and have a real discourse with this group, especially about the work that I'm doing in the American context, uh, North American specifically, and work that I do around African American art and artists in the American context. And so I'm deeply, deeply interested in how this translates to this audience, what meaning you can glean from this, what doesn't translate, um, but also I'm even sort of interested in what can actually be useful for this audience and the work that I do and what you think could be useful for myself. Um, before I started the standard talk, I realized there are some things that are sort of looming around my curatorial practice that I may want to address a little bit before I get into my exhibitions. And so I'm going to actually begin with a kind of sort of preview of what's really on my mind lately. Um, some of it may be broad-based, some of it is very particular to institutions in the United States, but again, I'm here as much for feedback and thought as I am for, to deliver my own thoughts and my own work. I want to make sure this bad boy is working, I'm not quite sure. Ah, there it is. <laughs> so, here we are. What's on my mind? Um, the first thing on my mind is one of the things that I think is uh, affecting institutions structurally, and that is a real conversation about philanthropic and, found, and funding models for U.S. institutions. I show you here a slide from uh, Art News, which puts together an annual list, the Power 200, the quote-unquote most powerful people in the art world, globally, and of course they're all in the US, um, but there are few in Europe. But if you look at the list this year, something interesting has happened. The person at the top of the list is Glenn Lowry, the longtime director of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, who has basically raised a half billion dollars in about a year or two. So we understand why this man is number one on the list. He's kind of built uh, an empire in a way, uh, getting sort of uh, individuals and foundations to separate with massive amounts of money. But number two is the artist Nan Golden, who basically about two years ago started a group called Pain, which was a group mostly of artists um, and other activists who organized against what they call toxic philanthropy in the United States. In particular, they were going after the Sackler family, which is one, who are one of the largest donors to cultural institutions in the States. But the Sacklers have made uh, uh, one of their primary sources of money, pharmaceuticals, 
and in particular, the selling of narcotics and opioids unnecessarily to millions and millions of people around the US. So much so that the um, life expectancy in the US has dropped within the last few years. So understanding this relationship between um, uh, the Sacklers and cultural institutions, Nan Golden and this group have staged several protests at cultural institutions uh, internationally. Um, and these protests are about pressures around where does money come from that funds culture. So it's not good enough anymore to just give money to our institutions. The questions people are asking now are, is it ethical, the money that's coming into institutions? And this is a real and a new pressure on institutions and one that we're all sort of grappling with, I think, in the museum world. What do we do with these funders that we deem a little bit problematic? The second thing on my mind uh, is really this question that I've been asking for quite some time, which is, what has happened to the so-called, let's say, third world alliances? Uh, probably shouldn't be called third world alliances anymore, but really the question is, what are the continued possibilities for cultural and political affinities and basically transcultural work across the developing world and specifically uh, for those countries that were part of the non-aligned movement. I have here a slide, a still from a video that premiered at Documenta 14, so we have Natasha to also thank for this. Uh, a beautiful, beautiful work by the artist Naeem Mohamed, British artist, uh, Bangladeshi's family, who did a sort of three-channel documentary that had, took a retrospective look at the non-aligned movement. And he sort of had a series of figures reflect on what that meant in terms of political possibilities, in terms of utopian thinking, and in terms of like really what fell apart and why did this fall apart and what have we lost in this. But he also probed some very interesting questions which, is around, which were around, let's say, the inequities in that so-called movement. He's probed the fact that there were financial structures that were really problematic. There was out and out racism inside this movement. Um, and so the real question is, what do we do now in this world where new alignments are starting to take place? Uh, how do we think about this kind of sphere that we call the Global South, which in and of itself is a semantically problematic term? On the one hand, it holds a lot of possibilities of thinking about uh, alliances and allegiances across Asia, the Caribbean, Africa, and so forth. And I would even count an African-American community in the US inside that. But also even the very term Global South basically presumes a standpoint from the North. So South compared to whom? South from what perspective? And uh, I've been thinking about this question, especially even this question above, uh, really in reference to my work, which are bigger questions around cultural representation. In other words, can we think about non-Eurocentric, non-American models, non-Northern models for talking through art history, for talking through culture and cultural development? And can we think about those models as more capacious and more applicable to things outside of the West and the North? I believe there's a lot a lot of pressure now on museums and institutions to find a new way. There's a recognition that the structures that we've had historically, the way that we've operated, have been exclusionary. They've kept out people of color, they've kept out certain geographies, they've kept out women. And so, so many institutions are trying to take corrective measures as we speak, i.e. the Baltimore Museum will only buy uh, work by artists of women next year. Good for them. I think this is an amazing start. But I also believe that there needs to be a certain move even beyond uh, a kind of, let's say, diversification of collections, beyond just including new artists in there. I think we need new languages, new thoughts, and new structures. I don't claim to have the answer <laughs> to any of this, but of course, maybe we can begin a dialogue today on what that may mean. So these are the things that have sort of been, let's say, um, occluding my thinking, or maybe not occluding in a bad sense, but it's the kind of mist around some of my thoughts and practices lately. So now we kind of go into the more formal side of my talk, which I will actually begin as a kind of tribute. Um, see, going backwards. I want to dedicate this talk 
to the memory. Forgive me. To the memory of Oquiem Laser, MDC Silva. The world lost two titans of art history uh, this year. First, uh, BC, surprisingly, in February, and then Oakley in March, just a few weeks later. These two premature deaths hit me quite hard, and as you can see, apparently, haven't sort of worn off in effect yet. But I think now feels like a time to sort of reckon with their legacy and their work in particular in and around the art world. They both work independently and at times within institutions across the world, creating new models for curators who want it to be rigorous without becoming academics or overly wonky. And Wazer, in addition to curating, was a co-creator of Inca Magazine, the first, internationally, sorry, the first international journal dedicated to contemporary African art. Silva's expansive career included creating the largest art library and research center on the African continent. And this project had a modest start in her personal book collection. Above all, these two curators changed the terms of how we think about global art. I am of a generation where engaging with the broad world is a necessary part of curatorial practice. I return to Silva's and Mwaser's work over and over again, as I try to work with art from outside the United States, outside my own cultural traditions, and outside my known world. And I would like to find deeper meanings in their work for the work that I and many of my colleagues do. I'd like to remember them in this talk and celebrate the, sample, the examples that they set. Their similarities are uncanny. Both were from Nigeria, about the same age, and each were dedicated to changing perceptions of Africa and African art. Previ excuse me, previous to their arrival in the art world in the 1980s and 90s, conversations in the States and in Europe about African art generally only refer to anthropological objects and spiritual sculptures, such as masks, figurines, and amulets. In other words, African art only referred to objects colonials encountered in their scramble for Africa. Somewhere between the colonial present, excuse me, the colonial period and the present, artists all over the African continent have been working through their own modernist and contemporary movements. But it seems that no art historians outside of Africa were aware at all of these developments. Thus, Silva and Mwaser use their vast intellectual resources to point out these double standards and, more importantly, to make new theses and tell new and different stories about art from the African continent. Now, I am not an Africanist, so the question is, what does this have to do with my own work? Well, I found that exchanging ideas with people of color in the cultural world, such as Silva and in Wazer, have been central to my work of constructing and reconstructing art histories. Their truly global outlooks also allows me to place North American works in conversation with artworks across borders, geographies, and time. Their outlook has also helped me locate blind spots in American art history, and even in my own thinking. I've come to understand that the project now is not about mere representation, but must go deeper into structural issues. The challenge now is a mode of production. What would a black mode of art history look like? Or how can we foreground other modes of production that black artists have undertook that look different from available European models or Euro-American models that may have missed something key to the work? Silva and Weiser and many others have posited that the need to look back and reconstruct history is not simply a way to tell new art histories or tell new stories but there are also ways to construct personal and community identities. I felt the need to do similar reconstructive history, work with art history. I happened to come along professionally when many artists in a great deal of art world, and a great deal of the art world, was deeply invested in doing just that, telling new stories and constructing new frames for identity formations. 
The moment of my education was the high moment of identity politics in the United States. A moment of increased participation for women and artists of color in the American art world. From my hindsight vantage point, I get to historicize identity politics as one of the many varieties of postmodernism. But I also have the opportunity to critique it as the art world still lives with identity politics terms around black art and black artists in, in, in the US, and those terms are limited and in constant need of expansion. Many misreadings, not the reality, but the misreadings of identity politics was that it set up a false binary between an artist having to choose between aesthetically engaged work or socially engaged work. You could make something that was beautiful or you could make something that was useful, quote unquote. But you couldn't do both. Not only is this a false bargain, but I have made it my career to do both, to acknowledge the resonance of identity, however that may be defined, on the production of art making to bridge the gap between art history and personal social history. So here's the personal answer to why the work of Nigerian curators matter to me. And it's based on two interrelated facts. First, I consider myself an unreformed Pan-Africanist, and I love the work of the black diaspora. And two, I am invested in con constructing smarter art histories for any artist but especially women and artists of color. So I will walk through two exhibitions that demonstrate my cultural concerns in action. I grew up on the south side of Chicago, a place with a deep interest in Africa. Starting in the 1960s, many African-American artists, dancers, musicians, writers, actors, etc., began to look to the continent of Africa for aesthetic inspiration and a spiritual homeland. Black artists took refuge in Africa, both a real and an imagined Africa, and I will stress that. Some really went to the continent, or the motherland as they call it, and others basically sort of invented an Africa that they could take as a source. As a counterpoint to the trauma caused by racism, oppression, and legally sanctioned white supremacy in the United States. Mostly known as the Black Arts Movement, this Pan-Africanist cultural work had its greatest academic exposition in Robert Ferris Thompson's 1984 book, Flash of the Spirit, African and Afro-American Art and Philosophy. As a Yale-trained, Yale-based professor, Thompson argued that there was indeed cultural similarities between black communities all over the world. Born from the Western African communities where the black diaspora originated. This is how I found myself, for example, taking West African dance and drumming classes on the south side of Chicago as a teenager, because this was simply assumed to be part of my heritage. This Pan-Africanist cultural work had its greatest proponents in New York, but elsewhere it was mostly dismissed as a minor art movement concerned mostly with futile utopian thinking and with propaganda, but not with serious art making. I wanted to make sense of, heritage, of this heritage, and I wanted to take it seriously. And one of my ways of thinking through that Pan-Africanist instinct was by curating a show as a love letter to Chicago's South Side. That exhibition, The Freedom Principle, Experiments in Art and Music, 1965 to now, linked the vibrant, leg le excuse me, the vibrant legacy of the 1960s African-American avant-garde, um, of the avant-garde, to contemporary art and culture. It was occasioned in part by the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians, or the AACM. The AACM is a still active union of Chicago musicians whose interdisciplinary explorations expanded the boundaries of jazz music. I'll pause actually and say, um, if you all have not seen Samson Young's exhibition, at uh, Experimenter, I really encourage you to do so, because Samson takes up some of the very questions that the AACM took up 50 years ago. Questions around authorship, questions around improvisation, questions around composition. How do we take something that feels like it comes out of thin air and is attributed to something like soul and give it notation and give it a rational system? 
And how do we then exit right back out of that rational system and turn it into something vibrant and living again? This is an image of one of the AACM's subgroups, the Art Ensemble of Chicago. And here you can see the musicians play characters just as they play music. So in the center on uh, the sax, sorry, what do you call this thing? The trumpet, sorry, <laughs> there's Lester Bowie um, dressed in a, um, in a lab coat, so playing the mad scientist. And you see other members of the band uh, dressed like African griots. Here's also an installation shot of a set built by current members of the Art Ensemble of Chicago that was in the exhibition where both performances took place and we even recorded an album there. And you can see there not only a kind of plethora of Western instruments, but instruments that traverse the world into Asia, um, and especially this kind of reference to uh, Egypt. Working alongside and often collaborating with the AACM in Chicago was the visual art collectives, the African Commune of Bad Relevant Artists, or AfroCobra. And as you can note, the name starts with Africa. And bad, by the way, does not mean terrible. It means badass. <laughs> Afrocobras, public murals, printing studios, and art workshops were part of a deep engagement with black cultural nationalism, both in Chicago and around the world, during and after the civil rights era. And while the Freedom Principle ostensibly looked at the formations of an African-American avant-garde in the 1960s, truthfully, it was a way for me to argue that there were real aesthetic forms and ideas undergirding the black arts movement. Ideas about color and shape, text and image, abstraction and figuration, still images and performance art, politics and beauty. So this was not at all a kind of minor movement, one that was uninformed by art history, but one where these artists were thinking very deeply about the history of art as much as they were about community and culture. For instance, Afro-Cobra members were acutely aware of the international triumph of American art in the 1950s was, in effect, the triumph of abstract art. Yet the collective also understood that the American art historical canon lacked figurative images of black people. So here we are, a moment where abstraction is all the rage, but you have an entire history that excludes a body and a community. Thus, an entire aesthetic was born, what they called a midpoint between figuration and formless abstraction, as you can really see here in that previous slide. <clears throat> and this aesthetic attempted to square away significant aesthetic form with social advocacy. More significantly, these aesthetic principles from the black arts movement still inspire contemporary artists working today, not just African-American artists, but are artists of all races and from around the world. And here we see another installation shot of the Freedom Principle. This is what we call the kind of contemporary side. It's divided into two, historic work um, and contemporary work. And you have artists such as Renee Green, who uh, hung the banners above. And those banners were all quotes taken from many political manifestos. But one of the quotes that she chooses is a quote from the sort of opening uh, the opening statement of the AACM. And so here is an artist taking direct reference uh, from, or making dire a direct reference to the, uh, to the AACM. And then other artists um, have a more, let's say, an affinity rather than a direct relationship to the AACM. And the AACM was interested in forms like democracy, so I asked Nari Ward to make a special edition of this work called We the People the opening words of the US Constitution as a way to think about democracy and community building. And then there's someone like Sanford uh, Biggers who created the ghetto bird tunic, that sort of mantle uh, coat that you see there. And, and Sanford uh, Biggers, though not, let's say, a student of the AACM, has always combined performance work with visual arts and music work and thinks of himself very much a kind of child of the 60s black art movement. The artists in the Freedom Principle, whether of my generation or that above, from the States or elsewhere, allowed me to look at, his, at a historic moment from a critical distance, a historic, a historic moment that even formed my nascent sense of aesthetics. And in doing so, I came to appreciate the scholarly impulses of these artists, 
and their deliberate moves to not only occupy an art historical canon, but to reshape it in their own image. So if an interest in Pan-Africanist ideas and the black arts movement sent me toward the work of African curators, then there is one more important lesson that I've learned from these forebears, and that is make a new master narrative. I have been trained as a good postmodernist and as a feminist to discount master narratives, mind you, but the value of a strong story is that it can displace other dominant and toxic narratives. I've applied that same principle to artists I've worked with, and especially when mounting monographic or solo exhibitions. Instead of repeating a known art history or a known story or trying to slot that artist's work into an accepted art history, I want to look firstly at an artist's oeuvre and their personal development and then make an art history and a story around that. I had to, a chance to do that recently with an exhibition, Howardina Pendel, What Remains to be Seen. This exhibition showcases a long career of Pendel showing over 50 years of work. And this art offered me an opportunity to look not just at Pendel's work in particular, but look at the development of American art in specific, especially as we watch her, move, her work move from abstraction into figuration. What does Pendel's work do for art history that's bigger than her studio practice? How can Pendel become a test case, as it has been argued, for the transition from American modernism into postmodernism. Though she is a black woman of a certain age, Pendel avoided the black arts movement in the 1960s and 70s. She was born, by the way, in the, uh, in the 40s, and so she would have been basically contemporaneous with all this sort of happening in New York City where she was living and working. But she was actually known more as a post-minimalist artist. In 1970, Pendel developed an approach to painting that would revolutionize her work. So rather than applying paint freehand to a canvas, she had been creating templates by punching hundreds of holes through cardstock. And as you can see in that center picture, she would take those cardstock strips and then tape them or staple them together until she could make something about two meters long, which she called her templates. Um, and then she would attach those templates to a canvas. And you see that in the image on the far right and then began to spray paint through those holes onto a canvas. So she's no longer even painting in a traditional way. She's doing something that's much closer to, let's say, a kind of printing practice or, well, even graffiti sometimes, people say. The results are these large-scale paintings that are covered in small overlapping dots that give the impressions of layers of sheer fabric. Pendel says this process was also a response to the lack of natural light in her studio and her desire to find a way of working that was less dependent on sight and more reliant on, feeling, on the feeling of her hands um, and her bodily movements. And you can kind of even see her there, kind of like pushing around on the canvas. And as you can see in these later works, Pendel miraculously saved each of those hole punches or chads that she punched out of those templates. So if you can imagine in her studio, there were thousands upon thousands and thousands of just hole punches. And then she used these to develop a new body of work in the mid-70s. Mid so after traveling to West Africa and seeing these large textile objects, she started making these sort of massive paintings, almost like a quilt by taking canvas, cutting it out into squares, and sewing these back together into a quilt formation. So she no longer stretched the canvas on stretcher bars. And at some point, she's not painting in a traditional way. Now she's not even displaying painting in a traditional way, nor is she even using paint as a traditional material. But she began to take these objects and nail them to the wall. And then she uh, would sort of make these more like sculptural objects. As you can see, they feel quite three-dimensional. She put a layer of paint over the canvas. It's kind of sewn to another quilt of a canvas. She would then sprinkle them with these chads, do another layer of painting, and do this over and over again until it had this sort of thick resonance. She would also add this accumulation. On top of this accumulation of paint, uh, paper, she would add glitter 
And she would then cover it with powder to take away some of the sheen. And then she would spray it with perfume. So you can only imagine, if you walk into a gallery in the 70s, you walk in front of these massive, massive paintings. And I don't know, sorry, I'm not very good at converting from inches to centimeters. But these are works that are like over two meters by three meters. Huge. Yes. <laughs> Gee, huge. But you walk into a gallery and see what looks like you know, this giant textile object that is glistening as you move past it. And you can smell something that smells literally like the woman's presence in the room. Pendel also had a double life. She worked as a curator by day, in fact, becoming the first black woman to hold a curatorial post at the Museum of Modern Art. And she was an artist by night. Though by 1979, she quits her job at MoMA, feeling pushed out due to her anti-racism political work. Politics had been a big part of her personal life and her social life. For instance, she was a committed feminist a founding member of the still active Artists in Residence Gallery, which championed women artists. <clears throat> but for the longest time, Pendel always kept the political work separate from her artwork. Modern art dictated that politics had no place in art, but Pendel experienced firsthand racism in the art world and came to understand by the late 70s that the art world was fair game for political criticism. Soon after leaving MoMA, Pendel is in a life-altering car accident. And that experience also brings about a political urgency to her work. Her first work after the accident was the iconic video, Free White and 21. And I have to apologize because I didn't even think to put a sample of the video here, but I'll try to maybe sort of walk through some of the elements of it. It's a video where she recounts moments of racism in her life. She talks about, for instance, she actually starts with her mother's life and talks about how her mother had a white babysitter when she was younger. And that white babysitter bathed her mother in lye because she thought her skin was too dark. And her mother lived with lifelong scars after that. She talks about uh, racism in the office at work. She talked about going to weddings and being in a wedding party and the only black person uh, at that wedding. She also, by the way, had a very privileged education. So she was often the only black person in a room, and at the wedding party, the uh, parents of the, of the bride went and shook everyone's hand in a row, skipped over her, finished in the rest of the line, and then came back and shook her hand last so that she wouldn't contaminate the rest of the party. So she tells these sort of stories, and in addition to sort of doing this from a first person perspective, as you see in the middle, on the far right side, you can see that she's also playing a woman in a blonde wig. And this blonde woman tells Pendel that she's lying or that she's even ungrateful. Ostensibly, the work is directed at racism among Pendel's second wave feminist colleagues. This moment represents a great break in Pendel's work. It's the first video. It's the first time she becomes narrative. But she also loses a great deal of her supporters. Those who love her experimental abstract work think that she's lost the plot at this point. But she's also gained new fans with African-American collectors and writers and with a new generation of feminist audiences. And that is also to say that she captured the imagination of yours truly. Free White in 21 marks the first time in her professional career that Pendel physically appears in a work. And now the body is no longer a metaphor as it was with these large quilt-like paintings. <clears throat> Here, the real body begins to activate Pendel's artwork. Pindell speaks in first person in her video, and for her next series of paintings, she starts to use the figure again. Here, as you can see, is one of her work from an autobiography series. And there in the center is a character based on her, but you can see that the, the body is kind of fanciful and really naive. Pindell graduated from Yale in 67 with a degree in painting. She's a rather accomplished realist drawer, a draw, a sort of drafts person and painter. And so the question is, why would someone create something that looks so de-skilled as this? And a lot of the, the answer to this lies in her technique. Instead of, again, painting freehand, which she had given up already in the early 70s, she basically lies down on a canvas, traces her body with a pencil or crayon, and then cuts that figure out of the canvas 
and sews it back into another that, like the earlier work, is created in sort of strips and or these cubes. And in that sense, the body appears very literally in the canvas. It's not a translation. It's not a kind of figuration of the body. It is the body itself that shows up. The body shows up in such a literal and immediate way, in fact, that some of the work, even from the 80s, includes her own blood. As I mentioned before, these new figurative works were thought of as a radical departure, when in fact, they are a continuation of her ideas and materials already extant in her abstract works. The unstretched canvases, the mixed media, the cutting and sewing, activating her hand and her body. So what does this mean then to call Pindell's work after 1979 a new postmodern direction when she had already developed those ideas in the so-called modernist work of the 1960s and 70s? Perhaps we need to look back again and see how her work can change how we define painting altogether in new ways. If we pause for a moment and stop thinking of the direction of Pindell's work or even any artist's work as a straight line moving forward, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> moving forward in one direction, we can see how certain ideas and concerns were already active in her early mature works. And these continue to activate her works to this very day. Here's a recent work, excuse me, <clears throat> that continues the same ideas from the early work. It is abstract, it has geometric forms, it's made of this kind of accumulation of forms, mostly circular. It's an unstruck canvas, it's a shaped canvas, and it has a very strong sort of monochromatic feel. But most importantly, especially for me, this work is in the shape of a spiral. And a spiral is a form that moves forward by turning back in on itself. The spiral, in my opinion, moves like history. It moves like memory. And it moves like artistic ideas. The spiral has become a great way for me, too, to think about art history, one that's also encouraged by a certain West African idea. And that idea is the concept of Sankofa. Sankofa is a word in the Tui language of Ghana that translates to go back and get what may be left behind. And more loosely translated, it means always remember history. Or when looking forward, always remember to look back. My look at African art and art history gave me ways and confidence to look again at African American artists especially those who found inspiration in African art. But I've also learned something key from contemporary African curators. Using African ideas as a model isn't simply, uh, isn't simply a mode of adopting African forms and seeking similarities to my own American culture. It means looking at the context and being sensitive to the cultural and historic situations in different parts of the continent. Contemporary curators such as P.C. Silva and Okwi and Weiser, their work taught me to learn from other cultures, not just look at them. This is what they called transcultural exchange. Transculturalism is different from a mere global exchange, which simply brings things together based on surface similarities. And this is a lesson that can be used anywhere in the world. If you are judging from the standards of one culture, and insisting on applying it to another, you are being insensitive at best, and at worst, lazy. So thank you in indulging me. In this thank you. Um, thinking where to start. Mm. It feels um, as though, you know, one of the sort of, I guess it's also in a way a kind of a, somehow a, an awareness and a warning sign at the mm. same time as I was thinking about um, just today, I think um, the artist Simone Lay mm. was um, put up a post um, criticizing a New York Times article that said black art has its moment finally as a headline. And um, mind you, that headline comes about every three years. <laughs> yeah, 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 and yes. then, and a, and a mm -hmm. hashtag that said, it's their time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and she, as an artist, wrote, 
stop, please stop describing your failures mm. as our momentary success. Mm. And it just, uh, and this is just now, you know, so I really felt like a lot of what you were saying mm. um, was a way to map out the grounding for this kind of commentary that is coming from extremely um, critical voices in the arts mm. from North America, but really speaking much more broadly um, to these these kind of precise inequalities that um, at one in, in one way um, highlight certain key institutions like MoMA or MCA, etc. But at the same time, there's a great risk yes. um, in the momentum that is now. Exactly. Um, so yeah, I guess what, what felt um, very relevant is the way that you are mapping that out here today, in one sense through the, the, an exhibition like Freedom Principle, mm -hmm. and in and the other hand, a solo practice yes. of somebody who is operating at this, at this double level of curator, artist, even if it was for a short time. Um, but I would like to understand a bit better how you apply that mm -hmm. within institutional dynamics. Because of course you're doing that um, when you're rereading art history, et cetera, but really to kind of make it a little bit more mundane and go into the, the, the way that you have done that from your time in Studio Museum mm -hmm. to MCA, what are the threats and how do you, how do you continue yes. to deal with these challenges? Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Natasha, actually, for that kind of synopsis of what's really, um, what I would characterize really as a crisis of criticism. I think in many ways certain, uh, certain artists, and let's just be explicit, and many sort of artists of color, uh, many women artists, artists from outside Northern Europe and the US, um, are often subjected to a kind of judgment from writers, art historians, and so forth, um, which is not the same as a kind of criticism, and that judgment is based on a certain standard, that, in my opinion, renders a lot of these practices invisible. So a lack of understanding about the art they looked at basically makes people deem the art as bad or insignificant. And so the first answer to your question for me really is about being a responsible art historian. I know we talk a lot about sort of curatorial practice as its own kind of like pedagogy. Um, you talked last year about how um, there's a kind of affect of labor and having to build up a curriculum around sort of curatorial practice in certain contexts. Um, but for me, it's been very, very, very important to basically do the basic labor of reading, the basic labor of understanding what terms are at stake for my colleagues who aren't invested in this work, but also understanding what terms are at stake for the artists who are doing these kind of practices. These artists are not stupid. They are not dumb. They are not bad. Uh, they are just not listened to. So that's step one. Um, the second one has been a very particular kind of uh, uh, positionality then in terms of being an art historian. And that is, I have to remain a kind of generalist. The art history world is sort of really respects deep, deep research. You got a PhD, life is good, right? <laughs> if you have spent years in a library, if you have kind of like needled your way into one topic <laughs> for like years on end, they love this stuff. I don't have that real luxury. I mean, I could do it, but I think that there's a kind of capaciousness to the work that I must do, that I need to develop a sort of literacy that's fairly broad. I cannot write about, you know, a kind of scabbard from the 15th century. I just cannot do it. I need to stay kind of, um, I need to kind of stay fluid in many sort of languages. And I even mean just many languages within the US, for that matter, and many periods as well. It also means being very careful about language. I do work in a museum and in an institution, and I find myself in an institution on purpose. These are the places that keep the objects. These are the places that keep the histories. And the language that goes into the archives of these places are deeply, deeply, deeply important. I have gone in and changed the labels in the collection at the MCA. Just erased stuff, started all over again. I have designated things to be rewritten by my team. 
There are certain moves that I can also make at the MCA as a collecting institution, which are moves around diversity. We have now sort of committed not to the MCA, at the MCA right now, to diversifying our own collection. We're not making moves as radical as the Baltimore Art Museum, but I have now been put in charge of collections, and you know, good luck to everyone under me. But, <laughs> but I, have, I have goals. I have goals to make sure that we tell a broader art history and we have more stories in the narrative that we have. We are an institution that's very deeply committed to a kind of Western European practice, bless it, that was considered, let's say, the cutting edge of things in Chicago at a certain time when the museum was founded. But as I've said before, it's to the exclusion of several people. So I need to start pulling, pulling broader voices into those conversations. And I have to do it intentionally. It can't be anything and everything. And so I think my last thing that I would um, say that I do is try to, um, in all that kind of broadness and capaciousness and generalism, not to be super global, mm -hmm. but to find focal points. Find things that are important to me, but also to the legacy of my institution, which I very much still respect. I'm not sort of tossing out the baby with the bathwater and saying it's all bad and they were all problematic because there's a bunch of white men there. What I'm saying is we need to bring all this work in conversation with each other. And so I've had to make very specific decisions around the work that comes into the collection, about what we exhibit, and also around, uh, around the language that we put there. Does that answer your question? Do you want to hear something more mundane? <laughs> that was great, thanks. Um, now let's have another question, and then I'm looking to the audience to, to get more. Um, I was hoping you could go a little bit more into talking through the freedom principle, mm, just mm -hmm. because it, I mean, personally, I know also through your colleague, Dieter Rolstrad, that it's a very complex project, and, and particularly the, the, the way that you, your, you describe yourself as a Pan-African sort of thinker, practitioner in some sense, mm -hmm. but also that the art ensemble of Chicago was Pan-African in its spirit, and that also was one of the radical mm -hmm. potentialities of it, uh, being Afro-American, but actually making sure yeah. that there was a kind of um, dissidence in the way that they, they used uh, mm. Uh, these these sort of strategies also of um, jazz and pre-jazz music. Um, and also the larger, I think just for the audience, it would be really great to think about the larger sort of uh, climate of collaborators um, and people who are still practicing, mm -hmm. like George Lewis mm -hmm. or um, you know other practitioners like Vadada Leo Smith, who mm -hmm. also use language scores and notation, and there's, and maybe also what kind of um, other exhibitions were inspiring for you. Mm. Like I wanted to mention for, uh, for, for those here that like Oku and uh with Diedrich Diedrich and others did an exhibition and a, and a book on ECM in Germany, which again worked with a lot of, uh, a lot of jazz uh, practitioners and other, um, other music producers, etc. cetera. Um, so that was a really other recent example that felt very relevant. Yes, um, yes. Um, first, maybe I'll give a little bit of historic background because I do think it's important to foreground a really interesting historic fact. So when the AACM was formed in the mid-60s, um, this is a moment basically where Americans really in the full thrust of the civil rights movement. But for the black community, this also didn't just mean um, a kind of new, let's say, legal mold. It also meant a lot in terms of thinking through history and heritage. So there was actually a very particular break at this moment for a lot of black people. The civil rights movement in and of itself was deeply invested in this kind of bourgeois respectability. Some of you may have seen images of protests where you see people really dressed in their kind of Sunday best. They're dressed like they're going to church. All the women in skirts below the knee and prim white blouses, the men in slacks and white shirts, if not suits and hats and so forth. There was a way in which these protesters were trying to embody some kind of American ideal, an American sort of middle class ideal. And part of the thinking also around that American middle class ideal was about a kind of erasure of the history of slavery. There were so many people who were trying to, let's say, elevate this black community outside of this kind of history of slavery. And there were plenty of people who actually denied that black Americans 
even originated in Africa. I mean, the trauma ran so deep, and it still does, and there are plenty of communities who can set it aside. As, you know, and of course, this has a lot of thinking, and this says a lot about the thinking around Africa is already itself not modern, not cosmopolitan, what have you, prehistoric even. And so when you get to group like all these members of the AACM who are very much at this point deeply upset by the assassination of Malcolm X, you get a group of people who are inspired by his embrace of Africa as an origin. So that kind of context of thinking through a new consciousness of the black community was deeply, deeply important for the AACM, but also, again, from Afrocobra. One of the founders of Afrocobra, Jeff Donaldson, was the first black man to get a PhD in art history at Northwestern in Chicago, at Northwestern University. So again, here is someone who's trying to bridge this kind of um, thoughts around origins of a black community in the US and this deep thinking around art history. And he began to do all sorts of really interesting projects in his own studio practice with Afrocobra, but also in leading these international junkets around the continent of Africa to do this exchange between African artists and American artists, mostly black American artists. There is also new thinking around what collective practice is, what it's supposed to be, and I would argue even that the form of the collectivity for the AACM and for, uh, for Afrocobra was really a way, as I kind of hinted at before, a way of thinking around new political forms, new communitarian forms, new forms that would take people outside of the structures of, let's say, the bourgeois sort of American middle class. It was a very much a political project, even projects in co-living um, and co-working and co-authorship that was, again, refusing all these sort of market drives, refusing political drives, and so forth. And so my project, really, for the Freedom Principle was manifest. One was to think about the aesthetics, which I'll come back to in a moment, but also to think about, about the democratic moments. What does democracy mean for a community that still had not been included in, or fully included, and some would argue still, haven't, they still aren't fully included in the American democratic experiment? On the aesthetic side, that return to Africa was very much built on what we have named as three principles for the freedom principle. One was improvisation. The second was collectivity, which I just spoke about. And the third was experimentation. And these three things were very much central to the practice of all the artists, both musical and performative um, and visual art. But the question was, how do you build a kind of exhibition, really, that's about improvisation and around collective practice? I think that, uh, in many ways, it was kind of a traditional show. In order to make a show um, that explained a history, you kind of have to do a historical exhibition. We had to do this work of pulling works out of the archive. We had to do this deep sort of dumpster diving, literally, into people's basements. Literally, we went to people's basement and pulled out things like posters from, and prints from like, the period. We had to find all the paintings that became the album covers for the AACM. I mean, we really had to do this deep kind of almost anthropological presentation in a way that you know, there's no shame in that. Again, if you are educating an audience, many of which who had never been exposed or heard of the AACM, it took baseline work deep baseline work. But there was also this kind of intellectual work that had already been done. As you've already mentioned, George Lewis, uh, a musician who teaches at Columbia University right now, and is from Chicago, uh, a member of the ACM, literally wrote the book on it. He wrote this incredible book called A Power Greater Than Itself. And he began to narrate in real time both the formation of the AACM. And I mean in real time, it was literally like, Lester Boy was coming up the stairs from the subway station one day and ran into like, I don't know, Art Tatum or whatever. And like they met up and went to somebody's kitchen and like started an idea for a song. And it was literally that <laughs> in depth. But then he's a deep, deeply, deeply intelligent musicologist. And so he began to like pull apart all the structures of the music, all the structures of the performances. And we didn't have to do that work. I mean, that's deep. That's deep ethnomusicology. And so we had to find our limits, too, of what we needed to pull together. I will finally say that one of my, one of my jobs as a, a curator in a museum is to always think about the audience. And so I can write very deeply in a book 
in the most kind of, let's say, advanced terms. But in the space of an exhibition, things need to be as comprehensible to the broadest audience possible. So we can talk about, let's say, these principles, like improvisation, collectivity, and experimentation. We don't have to break down the musicology of the experimentation of music. But what we can say is, essentially, that the AECM thought about new structures of music making. They thought about new structures of music notation. That the notation itself became art objects and that they were really interested in a kind of pedagogical practice that would allow for these forums to continue. Both teachers in Chicago, but both as many of them became university professors and still are university professors. You know, uh, in the traveling of transcultural things, mm. what we notice very often is that, of course, uh, abstraction travels well. But dense content, narrative, and very often, you know, communities which are in, in critical uh, mm. women artists, they have a lot of things to say. So it articulates as dense narrative. Mm. And very often that dense narrative is not able to travel well because it would require a lot to unravel not only that particular context, mm. but the, the context from which it's coming. So, this is something that, and how does one work one's way through this? Mm. Yeah. You know, what's really funny is that um, you're right, abstract and travels well, especially in the market. Um, it feels like the most translatable. Um, I think we can be smarter about what abstraction is. One of the distinctions that I often make between for students and for my teams is that not everything that looks formal is abstract, and not everything that is figurative is a realist thing, right? We have to start breaking down these relationships between the kind of trustworthiness of the figure and the legibility of the figure and the, the sort of easy legibility of abstraction. I don't believe there's any such thing. If you look, let's say, at indigenous practices in Australia and everyone starts talking about sort of dream paintings and so forth and so on, what we're not talking about is the way that these are actually landscapes and that there are visions of places that uh, exist. So in fact, it's a kind of realist practice. And so those terms even, abstract and figuration, have become deeply, deeply, deeply problematic. And this is what I mean by like, trying to push a little bit against the kind of easy recognizability of the global, which is there are these surface similarities that we can all sort of read because it's just pretty color and form, when in fact symbols have meaning, colors have meaning. They actually should be looked at in a more semantic way rather than a purely visual way. And that, in that sort of transcultural work of learning to decipher symbols and shapes and forms, that is the way in which we have to start unpacking everything. I don't believe it should be an easy read of anything at all. Um, my name is Chintan. Thank you for your beautiful presentation. Mm -hmm. When you talk about uh, black experience, do people tend to think of it as primarily about race, or do they see it as uh, in relationship with gender? And I'm talking particularly, I'm keen particularly to hear what you have to say about the experience of uh, black trans women in the United States, because even you know candidates in uh, who are you know contesting elections right now and happen to be queer are not addressing their concerns at all, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that does interest the practice of artists who are engaging with uh, blackness? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Chindra, for that question. And, and in fact, what you're talking about is an issue of intersectionality. In other words, that when we are talking around issues of race, we can't speak about it as a simple kind of experiential thing fully based on the color of one's skin or the base of one community. We have to also talk about gender. We have to talk about sexuality. We have to talk about class. You're going to have to forgive me because there's a beautiful work on this, a book, written by someone whose name completely escapes me right now, and I hope she forgives me <laughs> if she sees that. But there is a book, Intersectionality. Kim, Kim. Uh, it's, it's come to me, sorry. I still haven't had that coffee. <laughs> Pardon? Kim Crenshaw. Thank you. Exactly. In a word, we have to consider all these things, but the question is, did these movements and have much conversation around race in the States consider these things intersectionally? And the answer is no. There has been a bit of a failure of imagination around the ways in which 
the community is multivaried and multifaceted. And I would also argue the same, even around art history. Um, look, there are so many black collectives in the US, uh, Afrocoba included, that had deep issues with sexism. There's definitely a sense that certain women were doing more work than certain brothers, as we'll call them, in the institution. Afrocoba was a little bit better mm -hmm. than some others that came before historically, where women were dropping out like flies and starting their own collectives. There were also like black women lesbian collectives as well, art collectives, who were doing these kind of fringe works like the Kambachi River Collective, um, Kumbahi River Collective, where people began to splinter and splinter and splinter. There still, I don't think, is a solution to that to this day, right? And the question is, how do we, again, just establish language and more art history also around gender and art history as it intersects with race and art history, and especially, I think, class and sexuality in art history. Those things really still haven't, haven't coalesced in a kind of argument. It's worked well for legal, for legal statuses and legal arguments, but not yet for art history. And I think this is something you brought up, Simone Lee, something that she's really also trying to address in her work. Naomi, you were speaking earlier about mm. doing some sort of baseline work, I think you called it, when mm. it came, came to art history, right? And then you said something um, about how there was no shame in that. Mm -hmm. And I was curious to know why there would be shame in that? Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> or are these like institutional sort of frameworks that I am not tapped into and understanding? Um, it's a little bit institutional, I will say. But then there's also the sense that art historians and curators are two different breeds. Um, and that art historians are deeply invested mostly in objects. They're deeply invested in singularities. Whereas curators, I mean, they're the vast kind of impresarios, right? They're the ones who produce and think on the feet and on the ground. And you know, they have to create, 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 create. <laughs> endlessly and so forth. Um, but I, it's a false, it is another false binary, essentially. But um, I mean to say it in the sense that I don't know if um, in the kind of established curricula of curatorial practice, you're told to just like spend some time learning art history. I mean, you can walk into a curatorial program from any, any discipline. And there's nothing wrong with that, but that you do have to sort of educate yourself on the terms and the language. You do have to like, make yourself a little bit of a double agent. You have to learn the languages, period. Mm. On that note, thank you so much. You're very welcome. <laughs>